Hello there. Hello there. This is a very good year to be a Star Wars fan. The Obi-Wan Kenobi show is coming very soon, this Friday, May 27th. We haven't much time. The show after that is going to be Andor, and it's releasing later this summer, while Season 3 of The Mandalorian is premiering either late 2022 or early 2023. This Kenobi miniseries is arguably the most anticipated Star Wars project since The Force Awakens, so today we're going to talk about everything you need to know before watching Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Back in 2016, Obi-Wan was originally planned as a feature-length film, but following the disappointment of the Solo movie and the success of The Mandalorian, they shifted the idea to a miniseries instead. I think this is a much better choice. Honestly, I feel like the future of Star Wars is better suited for TV than it is for feature films. Maybe I'm still bitter from the sequels. I don't know. Are you going to play Obi-Wan Kenobi again? Yes. <laughs> After years and years of speculation, in 2019 at the D23 Expo, Ewan McGregor confirmed his return as Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi for a new series on Disney+. Plus. Finally, after many delays, we'll be getting the first two episodes on May 27th. There's going to be six episodes in total. I'll have the release schedule for the episodes up on the screen. Now, this is a limited series. It's going to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But despite this, Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy has said there is a chance for a season two due to the enjoyable time that the cast and crew had creating it, as long as there was a compelling story reason to return to the character. There's always a reason to return to Obi-Wan. We won. I think we're all gonna want a season two. Now it's interesting that each season of The Mandalorian had eight episodes per season, while The Book of Boba Fett had seven episodes. So this would be the Disney Plus show with the least amount of episodes. As far as the length of each one, that hasn't been confirmed yet, but the rumor is that they're going to range from 45 minutes to an hour. I don't know about you, but I would love a six hour long Obi-Wan show. So what is the story? The story begins 10 years after the dramatic events of Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, where we saw the Jedi were destroyed by Order 66, and Obi-Wan had to face his biggest failure. I have failed you, Anakin. I have failed you. Unfortunately, having the physical and moral high ground, I have the high ground didn't stop the downfall and corruption of his best friend and Jedi apprentice, Anakin Skywalker. You underestimate my power who of course turned to the dark side as evil Sith Lord Darth Vader. The show will follow Kenobi as he now lives in exile on the planet Tatooine, where he watches over young Luke Skywalker, but he's dragged back into the action when the Empire's influence makes its way to the remote desert planet. Finally, we're going to see what happened over the course of those 19 years in exile. Eventually, he becomes Old Ben, he has that awesome encounter with Darth Maul, but what's been going on all those years before that? The Jedi Order's all but been destroyed. Everyone else who wasn't um, destroyed in Order 66 is in hiding. So I've been, you know, and I'm carrying the guilt, or he, Obi-Wan's carrying the guilt of having failed Anakin and lost Anakin to the dark side. So he's a bit of a he's a bit of a mess, you know. He's at a very low point, and he's sort of in hiding. He's not being a Jedi. He's you know he's pretty bleak-minded. Now McGregor tells Entertainment Weekly, "We'll find Obi Wan at the beginning of our story, rather broken and faithless and beaten, somewhat given up." Executive producer Michelle Rejwan described Obi-Wan as being quite lost in a pretty traumatic moment. Obviously, this is due to the execution of the Jedi, the failure of what happened to his apprentice, and the guilt of leaving his apprentice for dead on the planet Mustafar. It sounds like we're going to see a very broken and emotional side of Obi-Wan. Director Deborah Chow was intrigued by the idea that Obi-Wan might still care deeply for Anakin despite his fall to the dark side. You were the chosen one! I loved you! We'll be getting a return of some familiar faces like Joel Edgerton and Bonnie Peace from the prequels, returning as Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. And most notably, Hayden Christensen is returning as Darth Vader. Now, having not played the character since 2005, Christensen has said that he's rewatched the Skywalker saga as well as the animated series The Clone Wars and Rebels. In order to prepare for the role, he mentioned how he's enjoyed seeing how the animated series has further explored the relationship between Anakin and Obi-Wan. Previously, he's portrayed the character as Anakin Skywalker for the most part, and now he's excited to portray Lord Vader. Now, at this point in the time, 
timeline, Vader is only 32 years old. This means it's Darth Vader at his prime. I think we're going to see a very unforgiving and brutal side to him. Deborah Chow has said the show's Vader is very powerful. It's not clear if we're going to see him out of the suit, if we're going to see flashbacks or force visions. Maybe he's still going to be struggling with the death of Padme. It hasn't been revealed yet if James Earl Jones will be returning to voice Darth Vader. He did the voice for Rogue One and a few episodes of Star Wars Rebels. Mind you, he's now 91 years old, but it's still a possibility. In November of 2021, Lucasfilm released some concept art including this image depicting Obi-Wan going lightsaber to lightsaber against Darth Vader. And given the fiery backdrop, it seems logical to assume this rematch occurs on Mustafar. Returning there would make sense since Vader has established his own base on Mustafar at this point in the timeline. Now, Vader is not the only villain. Moses Ingram will be playing the Force-sensitive Inquisitor Reva Savander. With the Imperial Inquisition on the hunt for Jedi, there has never been a more dangerous time for Obi-Wan. Reva is described as a ruthless, ambitious Inquisitor who shares a common goal with the Grand Inquisitor and Darth Vader. The Inquisitor's program had the task of hunting down any Jedi who survived Order 66. They first appeared in Rebels, and we saw them in the Darth Vader comic book series and in the Jedi Fallen Order video game. And personally, I'm really excited for their live-action debut. Now, the Grand Inquisitor is going to be played by Rupert Friend. We saw this character previously in Star Wars Rebels, but Chow and Rebels co-founder Dave Filoni specifically didn't want Friend to do an impression of the animated version, so it's going to be interesting to see his take. The Grand Inquisitor was once a member of the Jedi Order and previously served as a Jedi Temple Guard. Rupert Friend described the character as enjoying the sound of his own voice and naively believing himself to be on par with Darth Vader, wishing to replace him as Emperor Palpatine's apprentice if the opportunity arises. So uncivilized. Another Inquisitor, known as the Fifth Brother, will be played by Sung Kang, who we see appear in the trailers interrogating innocent civilians. Now this is during a time when the Jedi are still being hunted, and it seems obvious that Tatooine would be a place for Vader to be looking for his former master and Luke's upbringing. So it only makes sense for him to send his Inquisitors to his home planet. Kumail Nanjiani will be playing a street-level con man on the streets of Dayu, who then gets caught up in bigger stuff and he has to make a choice. Now, Nanjiani has mentioned he's researched real-life con men and magicians to prepare for the role. We also have some image reveals of Obi-Wan on the planet of Dayu, and according to writer Joby Harold, Dayu sort of has a Hong Kong feel to it. It's got a graffiti-ridden nightlife and is kind of edgy. It's just got a different lane and a different feeling. Now, to film Obi-Wan Kenobi, LucasArts is using stagecraft video wall technology. As opposed to a stage with blue screens or green screens, you're immediately in that environment. This is an on-set virtual production that's extremely impressive and was first developed for The Mandalorian. Whereby which we can have game engine, real-time render, and video wall technology coming together to create a backdrop for the big, beautiful world of Star Wars. Basically, it's a giant LED screen that's using the Unreal Engine to create various different locations without the use of CGI or location shooting. The director is Deborah Chow. Previously, she's written some episodes of The Mandalorian, which were fan favorites, Chapter 3, The Sin, where Amanda rescues baby Yoda from the lab, and Chapter 7, The Reckoning, where Darth Gideon makes his appearance. The show was originally written by Hossein Amini, whose notable screenplays include 47 Ronin, Drive, Snow White and the Huntsman, and lots of others. However, he stepped down from the project in 2020, and it's now being written and produced by Joby Harold, known for Edge of Tomorrow, John Wick 3, and Awake. We also have Stuart Beatty, Hannah Friedman, and Andrew Stanton credited as writers. Ewan McGregor is not only the title character, but he's also executive producer, along with Kathleen Kennedy and Michelle Rejwan. When asked whether there's going to be any aspects of the Legends books used as inspiration for the series, Deborah Chow said, We were trying to do a character-driven show, and there are different things that we looked at. I certainly looked at quite a lot of the stuff in the extended universe, but for us, it was first and foremost about him. If it felt organic to our story, we would bring something in, but we tried not to bring in anything just for the sake of bringing it in. Which makes sense. I am someone who thinks the extended universe has a lot to offer, and I'm hoping that we'll see some influence 
from maybe the Thrawn trilogy or the New Jedi Order books, or, you know, the Kenobi book by John Jackson Miller, which I think does an incredible job at recounting those 19 years on Tatooine with a very Western flair to the writing. I'm always going to recommend the Star Wars audiobooks because they have sound effects, they have music, and I just think it's a really great way to experience these stories. Now there's likely going to be some cameos. This is Star Wars. I think it's pretty likely that we're going to see a Qui-Gon Jinn cameo, and I'm positive that Liam Neeson would be open to retrieving his role. At the end of Revenge of the Sith, Yoda tells Obi-Wan he's been speaking with Qui-Gon through the Force, and that he will teach him how to do this. This also makes me think that maybe we'll see Yoda as well, as he's teaching Obi-Wan how to contact Qui-Gon possible he'll run into Jabba the Hutt, uh, maybe even a mention of Darth Maul. Though in Rebels, Obi-Wan is kind of older when Maul appears again. Now there's a lot of theories about Mace Windu making a return, that he never did die. Samuel L. Jackson has made it clear that he would love to reprise his role as Mace Windu if Disney gave him the call, so you never know. If you're wondering what to watch while you wait, obviously if you have the time, then maybe a fresh marathon of the movies is due. But also, Disney Plus has made a recommended watching list of episodes and movies. Surprisingly, many of the episodes on the list are ones that point to Kenobi's past with Darth Maul. I don't know if that means anything, but it's interesting that those are being recommended. Also, if you don't know, there's two animated series of the Clone Wars. The original Clone Wars was by the creator of Samurai Jack, and these are a hugely underrated masterpiece. There is so many standout moments with some really great visual storytelling and some of the best action scenes that the franchise has ever seen. You can find these on Disney Plus as well, so make sure to give them a watch. Though they're not considered canon anymore, but they're still worth your time. As far as Star Wars Rebels, it does take place after the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, but Rebels does introduce the fan-favorite Inquisitors, and it gives a few hints as to what Obi-Wan has been up to this whole time. Whether you like the prequels or not, Ewan McGregor as Master Obi-Wan is one of the very best elements of the films. He was able to seamlessly adapt the speech patterns and mannerisms of the original Kenobi played by Alec Guinness. But he also brought a lot of humanity to this character, who once had a much smaller role. The fact that at long last he's going to reunite with Hayden Christensen as Vader is pretty big. This is something I'm incredibly excited for. Let me know in the comments if you're excited, if you're going to be watching on Friday, and if if there's anything, if there's any important info that I missed, let me know as well. I'm thinking of possibly doing some episode reviews if that's something you guys are interested in. Anyway, thank you for watching, and as always, a big thank you to all my patrons.